good morning. Uh, uh, I, I'm filling in for, for Javed, and, and, uh, who is the chair of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Education, uh, Educational Analytics. Time is now 9.14, and, and I'd like to call the July 22nd Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics meeting to order. This meeting is held, being held via uh, video Zoom and telephone conference hall. And um, you can see why I really, really wanted an in-person meeting. But anyway, that just didn't work out. So um, before I begin, let me take this opportunity to welcome those joining us and ask that they observe the following etiquette. Please state your name before you speak, mute your phone when not speaking, and keep background noise to a minimum. Uh, we'll begin to, by calling roll to ensure we have a quorum. When I call your name, please respond to confirm that you're on the call. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Sam Torn. Here. Uh, Donna Williams. Um, welcome, Wilson. Here. And uh, Javid. We know that Javid's on the call. And so uh, do we have a quorum or do I need to uh, become a member of the committee? Well, let me just appoint myself as a, as a member. Uh, I'm taking my ex officio role off and, and now becoming a voting member of this committee. Uh, please record in the minutes that we have a quorum. Um, let's say I'd like to announce the appointment of our new uh, student representative, Levi McClaney. Mr. McClaney is from College Station and was appointed to the uh, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board by Governor Abbott in June 2020. Um, we'll, we'll introduce him formally tomorrow. I, I don't believe uh, Levi is on the call. Is that right? No, sir. He's not able to join us today, but he will be here tomorrow. Yeah, that's, that was my understanding. Uh, let's see. Agenda item two is consideration of approval of the minutes for the April 23rd, uh, 2020 committee meeting. Do I have a motion for the approval of, min of the minutes? So moved. Welcome, Wilson. I have a motion by Mr. Wilson. Second. So moved, Sam Torn. I have a second made by uh, Mr. Torn. Um, and members, when I call your name, please state whether you're for or against. Uh, those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. Uh, Mr. Torn. Aye. Uh, Ms. Williams is not here. Mr. Wilson. Aye. Uh, Mr. Anwar. Well, and I'm a, uh, okay, I'll take that as a yes. It uh, sounded like an aye to me. It sounded like an aye to me, exactly. And then I, I, I will also vote uh, aye. Motion passes um, based on the vote. Let's see, item number uh, the Agenda of item three is consideration of approval of the consent calendar. The consent calendar includes items that can be approved without comment or discussion. This allows us to save time for other items that need more of our attention. The consent items are highlighted in items in gray on the agenda. Due to current, uh, current circumstances, we have placed additional items on the consent calendar for the meeting. Of course, any board member can request an agenda item be removed from the consent calendar. This will give us an opportunity to discuss those items or that item in more fully later in the meeting. The following items are on the consent calendar for consideration. Agenda item E, consideration of adopting the staff recommendations of the committee relating to the approval of the energy savings performance contract for Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. Agenda, agenda item F, review of facilities projects that were submitted to the coordinating board. Agenda item G, consideration of adopting the staff recommendations of the committee relating to the report on the Texas grant program. At this time, I'd like to add the following item to the consent calendar, agenda item 5D, uh, consideration of approval of staff recommendation to change the committee on affordable affordability, accountability, and planning to the committee on innovation, data, and educational analytics, wherever it appears in the board rules. Are there any other items that anyone wants to add to the consent calendar? Hearing none, are there any items that anyone wants to remove from the consent calendar? Hearing none, uh, do I have a motion uh, for approval of the consent calendar as amended? So moved, Sam Torn. Uh, motion by Mr. Torn, do I have a second? Second, welcome Wilson. Second by Mr. Wilson. Members, and I call your name, uh, state whether you're voting for or against. Those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. Uh, Mr. Torn. Torn. Uh, Mr. Torn. Aye. Uh, Ms. Williams is on the call. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Aye. And 
Mr. Anwar? Aye. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I will also vote aye. Motion passes uh, based on the vote. Let's see, agenda item four is, is public testimony on agenda items relating to the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. Yes. Public testimony in support of agenda item 5H1 of proposed rules. Agenda item 5H1 is consideration of adopting proposed amendments to chapter one, subchapter A, section 1.18 of board rules concerning the, op the operation of education resource uh, research centers. Members will hear the public uh, uh, testimony at the appropriate time for the agenda. Agenda item 5A um, is, uh, is, is a uh, 60 by 30 Texas data insight discussion of COVID-19 impact on summer enrollment. Dr. Julie Eklund, Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Planning will provide this presentation and will be available to answer questions. This item is for information only. Thank you very much, Mr. Stedman. Uh, I hope everyone is able to hear me this morning. I'm pleased to be here with you all today, committee members. Uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you the summer 2020 preliminary enrollment headcount. Next slide, please. So every fall we request preliminary headcounts from all of our public higher education institutions, as well as our private nonprofit institutions. Preliminary headcount enrollment is a leading indicator for many higher education priorities, including completion, attainment, and funding calculations. So it's information that we have gathered for many get decades. This summer, we decided to take a look at preliminary summer enrollments for our public institutions only. And this is something we haven't done before. It was a very tight timeline for our public institutions to turn around census date data for us. Uh, but we thought it was a, a critical time to be gathering data for all of you. Uh, we needed to wait for our census date enrollments to come in um, because of concerns that normal patterns might not be playing out this summer because of uh, the current uh, COVID environment that we're in. We appreciated all the extra efforts that our institutions took to provide us survey data about their enrollments this summer. Uh, in fact, this information is hot off the presses. The deadlines were, were just a few days ago. Um, and so we're very, uh, very thankful to our institutional partners who reported to us. We heard from every, in, every public institution in the state with their preliminary summer enrollment. Next slide, please. So here are the results of our summer 2020 enrollment collection. And we have compared the results to our uh, summer 2019 data. And you can see the percent change there from 1920, as well as uh, we have shared our summer 2018 enrollment data. Data, As you can see, enrollments are up 11% overall at our public institution from summer, ni summer 19 to summer 2020. And our public universities are showing the largest gains. The second summer session for our community colleges, because we collect data from them uh, twice in the summer uh, actually shows a greater in increase than we're seeing than uh, we saw from our summer one enrollment uh, compared to summer 2019. Uh, you, I also think it's important to point out that we did see a fairly large drop in enrollment from summer 2018 to summer 2019 at the community colleges. You can see that here. Uh, this may be due to the economy being strong last summer. Uh, our change from summer 18 to summer 2020 overall is about 7.2%. So that 11% change, again, represents last summer to this summer. Last summer was a little bit lower than usual, uh, um, lower than we'd seen before. Uh, so we've seen about 7% since summer 2018. Again, very, uh, very interesting data trends. And moving on to the next slide, we thought it would be helpful to share trends with you. And on the next slide, you will see uh, summer enrollment trends uh, since 2016. You can see the drop at community colleges from summer 18 to 19 that I just explained, and that's in red. And then, of course, the jump that we've seen this year. The university and health-related institution enrollments, whether summer or fall, tend to show steady trends over the years. Uh, on this illustration, those are the dark blue and light blue lines, respectively. The university trend line illustrates why the increase for this summer is particularly striking in terms of the 16% increase we see at those institutions compared to last summer. 
although we can't know for sure exactly why we see this increase, one could speculate about several possibilities. Students may have been less able to get jobs or internships over the summer, so chose to continue and take courses. Institutions have also been working very, very hard to provide incentives to, uh, for students to continue their enrollment. Next slide. In terms of enrollment growth by our demographic groups, we see the largest incre increases in our other groups category, uh, which is primarily Asian students, but also includes Native American students, Pacific Islanders, uh, students with multiracial backgrounds. Uh, the next group after that is our Hispanic students. We see lower increases for our white and African American students, but as you can see, every, every group is up from the prior summer. Areas of the state with high Hispanic populations had some of the highest growth interests uh, increases, which could explain the increase we see for our Hispanic students. When we have final certified data this fall, we can look and see if there's a difference for other groups, such as economically disadvantaged students. We'll also be able to look to see if we see some differences in our, in our dual credit enrollments, because we've heard that dual credit uh, increases may be partially responsible for some of the increases that we see at community colleges. For our preliminary and summer enrollment, we simply get our enrollments uh, by gender, race, ethnicity, and of course, overall. So uh, we're, we're happy to have this amount of data to share with you uh, so early in the season. Next slide, please. And so I wanted to share this. I mentioned region, regional differences a moment ago, and this shot slide shows some of the differences in our preliminary enrollment for this year versus our enrollments that we saw, uh, that we saw last summer. I do want to point out the enrollments for last summer were certified enrollments uh, that we see received at the end of the summer. These are preliminary enrollments, and sometimes we do see some variability in preliminary versus certified when we look at the data in the fall. For summer, this is, a, of course, a new collection for us, so it'll be interesting to see uh, if we see some, some differences from our preliminary to our certified. Uh, but I did want to show you some of the differences we saw from last year's uh, summer data, certified summer data to this year's preliminary uh, by region. And you can see South Texas and Upper Rio Grande are some of, their, some of our biggest areas of growth, which could account for uh, some of our larger increases for our Hispanic student populations. Uh, but you can also see very high growth in the Southeast region. The Lamar two-year colleges and Lamar, Lamar University had large growth. Uh, you can also see Central Texas has grown a lot, and that's an area where we have uh, some of our uh, research institutions, uh, such as UT Austin and Texas A&M, as well as Texas State, emer an emerging research institution, their enrollments were also, were also up. Um, you can also see here that uh, West Texas has an increase in the double digits, and we thought that was interesting. Uh, it could be that some of these increases are tied to the economy. If students aren't able to find jobs, they are enrolling in summer courses West Texas is an area where we, we see uh, connections between enrollment and what's happening in the, in the oil industry. Thank you, next slide. So this slide shows uh, gender differences in our headcount enrollment from uh, this, this uh, summer uh, compared to last summer. Uh, so in summer 2018, our enrollments were 40% male and summer 19, that they were 39% male. And this summer, our enrollments from our preliminary enrollments are 37% male. So we're seeing some shifts there. And many of you have probably seen some of the federal data showing that females have lost, lost jobs at higher rates than males during the COVID-19 period. This might explain some of that enrollment shift uh, if women in Texas were more likely to lose jobs and need retraining. So again, there could be some connection there. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, on the slide when we we're looking at regions, that uh, job availability may have something to do with uh, what we're seeing in terms of these enrollments. Next slide, please. So there, there's really a lot of food for thought in these preliminary summer data enrollments. As you can see here, most of our public universities had higher enrollments than usual, but we did have a few universities, smaller, smaller universities, uh, that, that showed, uh, showed some drops, and so and one as low as a 30% de decrease. So uh, some, some real variation. For community colleges, we also saw variation. Uh, much of the, when you see the, the high levels of variation here from decreases uh, 
almost 90% increases of over 100%. A lot of that variation was seen at our smaller community colleges where they tend to have fairly low summer enrollments already. Uh, at our larger colleges, we didn't see quite such large, sprint, such large differences. But overall, two thirds of our community colleges showed increased enrollments compared to last summer and about a third show a decrease. The Texas State Technical College's enrollments were down considerably from last summer, but I actually was in contact with their chancellor yesterday who informed me that their spring semester started late uh, and then they had a rolling start to summer, of course, because of uh, some of the situation with the, the pandemic. So although we showed their enrollments to be down quite a bit, uh, they believe they'll, they'll be down uh, just about 10% and we'll see a lot of the later enrollments that are happening now at that institution reported to us uh, as flex enrollments, which are enrollments that come in after the census date. Um, it is interesting that their enrollments are still going to be down. I also talked uh, or had, a, had contact with folks at San Jacinto, Insti San Jacinto College where they, have, they do a lot of career and technical education and they were down about 21% in their career and technical education area, although they were up 7% for their overall enrollment. So some of these programs that have hand, hands-on classes may have been negatively impacted. Um, tied into that, we also saw a drop of about 17% in some of our physical therapy programs uh, at our health-related institutions. So again, we're really seeing some differences out there because of the current, current situation. I do think it's important for me to reiterate that institutions have really had to be innovated this, this summer to respond to the challenges of the COVID-19 epidemic. You know, some of the changes I just mentioned uh, that they were, they were making at the TSTC institutions, uh, some of what we've heard from other institutions. So I think it's important that we take these data with a grain of salt. Um, we understand that uh, folks might, it might be helpful to reach out to institutions if there are questions about some of the differences because again, we're in a, we're in a very different environment now. Uh, so I did wanna make sure to, to add that caveat to this, to this presentation. We, we, haven't had to, we haven't had the opportunity to have personal connection with every institution, but there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, things happening, a lot of changes happening at institutions to try to, to, try to adjust. Uh, so uh, last slide. So we're gonna have more information once the full summer data sets are certified. That'll be sometime this fall. And I'll be sharing preliminary headcount enrollments for you this fall at the uh, October board meeting, as I always do. Again, I wanna thank the institutions for getting this data to us so quickly. I think it's been really valuable data. And I also wanna thank my staff who went above and beyond to turn around this information quickly for you so that we could share it with you today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Dr. Eklund, this is Welcome Wilson. A uh, great report, by the way. It's very interesting, uh, these dynamics, which are in uh, uncertain times. So it's, it's, there's no way to guess on or, or predict uh, how these things turn out. Uh, were, were most of the institutions online this summer only, or do we know? Dr. Eklund, we can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's, it's my understanding that they've been primarily online, uh, but I can't speak to those that were fully online versus those that might have created special circumstances to allow, to allow uh, students to come in. I believe there was some, some of that happening, too, maybe for some of those uh, hands-on type courses. In the future, uh, because we, no one knows, uh, I've heard of hybrids where they're starting online and then switching to regular session during the fall, some are all online. Uh, I think it would be very informative uh, for the board if we were to figure out a way to track that uh, for the fall uh, in order to well, predict trends. Thank you, yes, that's a, that's a really good point. We will actually be able to look at that for summer once we get our full certified data. Institutions do report to us whether courses are online or whether they're hybrid. Uh, and that's gonna be important for information for us to follow. In fact, we might do some additional collection this fall, but uh, we will we'll certainly provide uh, be able to provide some information on how courses were offered. That'd be great. I'm sure the legisl our legislature would, that would be great information for them in trying to plan going forward on cost of education and types of education, et cetera. Absolutely. 
Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Eklund. Well, I, you know, one thing, uh, uh, the data really surprises me. Um, you know, I read, uh, I, don't read I skim, the, the bulletins from the Chronicle of Higher Education. And um, almost every week, they talk about the impact of declining enrollment on university finance. So is that just fake news? We, uh, we can't hear you. Uh, Commissioner, I, I, perhaps you'd like to address that? Um, sure. I'd, I'd, I'd say um, uh, that well, one, of the, one of the points Julie made that I, wanna, uh, that I would want to underscore is we, we saw a lot of variation. So the big difference between the semester credit hours taught this last summer at uh, UT Austin versus Sol Ross, for example. Uh, Sol Ross would be one of the universities that uh, saw some declines uh, this this last summer. So it, it depends a lot on where you are. And uh, in general, across the country, uh, everybody's impression is that this uh, um, disruption has exacerbated some of the trends in enrollment that we've seen before. So New England institutions, uh, Midwestern institutions, um, the uh, Mid-Atlantic institutions, um, that uh, particularly institutions that uh, have been relying increasingly on out-of-state students um, are hit especially hard. And um, so as we look deeper into the data and we talk to the institutions, um, that'll continue to be an issue for our Texas institutions as well, uh, particularly on the graduate side. Um, so out-of-state institutions or out-of-state students or international students um, might not be able to travel and uh, those uh, enrollments will be impacted uh, uh, pretty considerably um, what we understand from the institutions for this fall. Anyway, very, very interesting. What's, what's, what was fascinating to me is that we were up from two years ago. I mean, you can explain the, the decline with the, the, the good economy, uh, but then up from two years ago, and, and it, it, it sure, I don't think it can be explained by population. So anyway, good stuff and welcome uh, uh, question was excellent. You know, what is the percentage online and, and, and all that? I think we we'll need to explore that. Uh, let's see, moving on to agenda item 5B is an update on uh, the data infrastructure modernization project. Uh, Ms. Lori Fay, uh, ah, excuse me, um, Deputy Commissioner for Innovation and Policy Development will provide a presentation and be available to answer questions. Lori? Good morning. Can everyone hear me all right? Oh, by the way, let me just say, I, I see. Uh, uh, Ms. Williams has just joined us. Uh, Javed had some technical difficulties in, in uh, uh, his audio, so I've kind of taken over uh, just for this time for at this uh, for this committee on. Um, it, it got to look at it again. The Innovation Data and Educational Analytics, the Idea Committee. So, welcome, uh, Ms. Williams. Yes, good morning, Mr. Stedman and committee members. I'm delighted to be here today for what is my official, my first official presentation to this committee since joining uh, the agency back in February, which in a lot of ways feels like a lifetime ago, as I'm sure you all can, uh, can attest. I'm particularly excited to share an update on a project that we are launching to modernize the coordinating board's data infrastructure. You will often hear the commissioner comment that the coordinating board data represents an incredible strategic asset and that one of, his, one of his priorities is to envision the next frontier of the usefulness for that data. And this project is specifically focused on creating that vision. Next slide, please. As you know, Texas is regularly recognized as a leader in longitudinal education data collection and use. And we are the envy of many states because of this rich history. As an example, we collect course credit and grade information for every student in our public colleges and universities every semester. The coordinating board also serves as the hub for the combined data from Texas Education Agency and Texas Workforce Commission, which along with our higher education data populates important services such as the Education Research Centers and the state's P20 longitudinal data repository, the Texas Public Education Information repository, which is a mouthful, resource, sorry. Uh, we also provide more than 300 pages of data on our agency website, txhighereddata.org. So we are clearly data rich. However, while that wealth of data is very valuable, it's not currently easy to use 
for access. You can imagine with the, that number of pages of data, you really have to know what you're looking for in order to find it. Uh, one of the realities of our long collection, uh, of our long history of collection is that, that our technology has also grown up over time and often with limited resources which means that we, um, we don't have a master plan and, and, um, and that data can be hard to bring together and difficult to analyze. The depth and breadth of that data presents something of a challenge actually in providing it to, in, to stakeholders in ways that are easy to access, understand, and use to identify trends or improvement opportunities. And this presents a particular challenge for our smaller institutions where, where uh, research capacity is limited and for our stakeholders who are looking for straightforward answers to their questions. Next slide, please. The project we are undertaking aims to build on this robust foundation of data, of existing data, and increase the accessibility and usability for decision-making and improvement purposes. Specific, in short, we're looking to go from, from data-rich to insight-rich. Our vision for this project is to equip our internal and external stakeholders with improved insight, analytics, and data to drive better decisions. And we have three overarching goals. First, to design and begin implementation of a modern and flexible data architecture that is focused on user-centered value and allows for dynamic access with the appropriate governance and uh, privacy, security, and confidentiality controls. Second, we seek to identify and deliver high priority reports, tools, and dashboards that utilize our current data in more meaningful ways. And third, we will continually need to evolve our processes and our websites to support these new offerings. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you a high level look at the timeline and key activities we see for this project. Uh, across these three phases. The planning phase, which we are kicking off in the next uh, couple of weeks, is envisioned to be to, to take uh, four to six months. We think the, the subsequent phase of more detailed design will take about four months and the implementation will uh, be dictated by the outcome of these two, these two uh, initial phases of work. We're currently preparing to launch work with a consulting firm with expertise in large scale education data systems that will deliver three categories of, of, um, of work products. A summary state of stakeholder needs and priorities that will be uh, driven by the stakeholder outreach activities in phase one. Second, documentation and assessment of our current state so we know uh, our starting place. And then third, the conceptual data architecture design. In addition to these technology oriented deliverables, we will launch an assessment to review our current governance practices, including those that oversee our combined, access, our combined assets, such as the research centers and uh, the TPR uh, resource that I, that I, that I uh, identified earlier. We'll be working to identify areas for improvement and set the stage for enhancing those practices as our new capabilities come online. The budget for phase one is just over one and a quarter million dollars and is being funded by a grant to the Texas Higher Education Foundation. And I would say that we have three very specific goals or four very specific goals for this uh, first phase. One, we do seek to identify uh, and deliver new near-term improvements in data presentation and, um, and sharing that's responsive to stakeholder needs. That's a really important priority, we believe, because of that treasure trove of data that we have existing today, we have the ability to actually turn that uh, around to our, in particular, our institution stakeholders uh, in new and very meaningful ways. Second, to select an appropriate data and technology conceptual design and develop plans for implementation Third, as I mentioned, we will be uh, strengthening our existing data governance processes to support both current and future needs. And fourth, we, work, we will be working to simplify and upgrade both the usefulness and the user experience of our existing agency websites. We look forward to bringing uh, an update on the progress of this effort to you at the October meeting, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Oh, Mr. Is, Stedman, I think you're on mute. So, so Lori, who, what group, what stakeholder group is most, you know, in need of this data, um, other than the coordinating board itself, which you know, like, is immersed in data and our commissioner and everybody else, I mean, loves data. But I mean, who, who is going to use this once it gets out there? Who, who, what, what comes up, up first to your mind? I think we'll, one of the things, one of the places where we think we can improve our offerings dramatically is back to our institutional stakeholders. So in a lot of ways, the data flow today is a one-way street and they may ultimately get data back um, following the certification process and the publication process on the website, but we actually see being able to provide data back more dynamically uh, at the student level to our institution stakeholders so that they can monitor important things like student progress to cr toward credential and uh, some other meaningful, other meaningful measures. The, I, we will be relying on our stakeholder engagement activities with institution partners and other stakeholders to help inform what those priorities look like. And, and, and so I, okay, so that's obviously, you know, student progress and, and or lack of progress perhaps so that so they can, you know, intervene. I mean, that would, that would help in those efforts. Yes, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's, that's very significant. Uh, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, Lori, appreciate okay. it. Uh, next item, uh, agenda item 5C is consideration of approving the commissioner's recommendation to enter into services contracts for access to student out-of-state data. Uh, Dr. Julie Eklund, Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Planning, will pro uh, provide a presentation and be available to answer questions. Dr. Eklund. Is everyone able to hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, I'm here seeking the committee's approval for the agency to purchase data tracking and related services from the National Student Clearinghouse, uh, or NSC, for summer 2020 through summer 22, 2022. If approved, these data provided under NSC Student Tracker Premium Services will be used to track the educational progress of Texas students who enroll in higher education in other states including tracking outcomes such as persistence and completion. And this is something the commissioner just mentioned. It's important for us to understand what's happening uh, with our students from, uh, who, who leave the state as well as the students who come in from other states. The National Student Clearinghouse provides a nationwide central data cooperative for education records from participating post-secondary institutions. They also provide a number of data management services for institutions and for states. The way the clearinghouse works is that higher education institutions engage the clearinghouse to process and disclose education records on their behalf. As a result of an over 98% participation rate nationally, the clearinghouse is able to provide information for the vast majority of students in the country. They are the only organization providing this level of this type and level of service. And of course, our particular interest is in learning about the students who leave Texas and adding students level out-of-state data to the agency's data resources. It will enhance the coordinating board's ability to analyze and therefore better understand the student educational pipeline and will also, will also help inform the 60 by 30 text higher education plan progress metrics. For those of you who have been on the board for a while, it's been since 2016 that we've had some of this detailed level data. So some additional benefits will result from this contract. The services will provide access, the premium services will provide access to custom reports and visualizations of data and more timely updates to both in and out of state, in and out of state enrollment and completion data. So we'll be able to get things more quickly. The contract will allow for providing de-identified data to the state's three education research centers, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about them later uh, under our contract with those entities. And in year two of the contract when NSC data on public high school graduates will be available to assist the Texas Education Agency in tracking high school graduates who leave the state to pursue higher education. Finally, something that I think will be of uh, real interest to Texas institutions, the public universities, health-related institutions, and two-year colleges in Texas that currently purchase student tracker standard package services from the clearinghouse, which is just about all of them, uh, but those that don't already have premium services 
will have the ability to upgrade from those standard services to premium services at no charge for the full two-year period of the contract. Those whose student tracker premium services will expire during this two-year period may also upgrade for the end of the contract period at no charge, no additional charge. And the institutions will be able to work directly with the clearinghouse to get access to these upgraded services. So we won't need to be the middleman, uh, but they will get these, uh, get these additional services through because of our contract. So in terms of the cost of the contract, the 86th Texas Legislature included funds for access to out-of-state student data in the 2019 budget, uh, moving, of course, for 20 into 20 and 21 under the agency's administrative funds. The appropriation covers both years of the biennium and the contract will total approximately 240,000. Uh, we are in the final stage stages of negotiating the contract and we are seeking your approval. I'm happy to answer any questions. The, uh, what, to what do you attribute the 98% partition, participation rate? That's impressive. And what's, what's the incentive to get them to participate? I'm curious as to their secret as to how they did that. That's a good question. And in a little more detail, they're over 98% for those Title IV institutions. Um, so it, it's, you know, our, our, your, your traditional higher education institutions, public and private, are, they're at 98. I think they're at 93%, even if we include career schools and in some of our non-traditional institutions. So they have, they have a lot of data. Uh, I believe that institutions are very interested in gathering data about students who uh, leave their institutions. Uh, and so if you do have students who transfer out, it's a way to see if that student did not complete or in fact, if that student can be found in another, in another state or even at another institution within the state. So it's, it's valuable information for the institutions. They're also able to see what happens to applicants because it's not just enrollment data, it's applicant data. So if someone applies to a public university, for example, but doesn't enroll, that institution is allowed to track applicant data uh, through through contracts if the students have allowed for disclosure and see what happened to that student. Did they enroll somewhere else? And now we'll, of course, be able to see that type of information as well. So I think it can be very useful in understanding student pipeline, student movement. Uh, you probably heard the term swirling where students attend different institutions at different times. I think it'll be, uh, it'll be valuable to us in the same way it has been to the institutions. And these upgraded services will allow for more frequent requests as well as uh, better analytics, uh, visualizations, those types of things. Uh, so uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a, I think, I, a priority for, for all of us to be able to have, to use this, uh, the data that we have and integrate it with other data sources uh, that are there. Well, yeah, I think maybe I'm just, I think Mr. Wilson, uh, the, business, the businessman as he is, was, was intrigued by the uh, uh, monopolistic uh, 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 position of this particular uh, uh, company. But anyway, it's, it's very, very, uh, it sounds, sounds like something that you know, we, we, we need to do. Glad the legislature is, uh, it supported us. Uh, let's see, do I have a motion for the approval of the recommendation to enter in a services contract for uh, access to student out-of-state data? I have a question. Oh yeah, please. Yeah, so the money was appropriated by the legislature and it's in our budget, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. How much? Overall, I believe it was $230,000 for the biennium, $115,000 per year. But, it, but we also in the past have, have uh, ordered the basic services. So we had a, a little additional money in our budget that will get us to the $240,000. So it, it, we're pretty much covered from this appropriation, which was for this purpose to track students uh, who are going out of state. Thank you, I move for adoption. A motion by Mr. Torn, do I have a second? Uh, welcome Wilson, second. Uh, second by Mr. Wilson. Uh, members, when I call your name, please state whether you're voting for or against. Uh, those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. Uh, Mr. Torn? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Anwar? Aye. And uh, since I've now appointed myself on the committee, uh, I wrote I uh, two motion passes. Um, let's see. Items. Before before we move on, could I just chime in and say a thank you to the board and just underscore why this is so important? Uh, this vote that you just took. So so now every what this is going to mean is every college and university in the in the state is going to have access to these 
automated reports about what's happening with students. So if students drop out or stop out, they'll be able to see if they re-enroll. Uh, they can automate reports on the students that don't matriculate with them, where else across the United States they go. And these, um, these are updated monthly. So uh, we're gonna have much uh, closer real-time data about what's happening with students as they come into and out of institutions, as they transfer among institutions, even when they transfer out of state. So that's, uh, that, that's an important sort of first step in this direction that Lori was uh, talking about earlier, where we can be a resource to the institutions, provide them with, uh, with better, more actionable tools from our smallest community colleges to our biggest research universities. When does this take effect? So as soon as we sign the contract, then, they, then essentially uh, the clearinghouse will turn on the service uh, for the colleges. So they can have, they can, as soon as the contract is done, they, they can uh, have access to those services right away. And one of the things I love about uh, the kind of resource they provide is the institutions also have the option of being able to append their own data and run their own queries. So um, they can turn the data on and go ahead and start um, running these uh, running these reports and even look at like, well, students who participated in this success program, uh, did we see better uh, persistence and matriculation rates or what happened to students who dropped out and stopped out? But they could they could do that kind of thing right away. So in that regard, and going back to Mr. Wilson's question on the previous item, are we anticipating because of the circumstances at universities uh, and the, uh, both the health circumstances and the fact that so many classes are gonna be online that there might be a number of in-state students who do not re-enroll and therefore this, uh, I know this is for out-of-state, but, but our in-state would even be more important so they'll be able to see all the students. Um, and and it's, so it's particularly important as students go in and out of state where we wouldn't have a window on those enrollments, but they'll be able to see what's happening with all, this, all the students. And Mr. Torn, I think you're exactly right that we need to keep a close eye on this, um, particularly for low income students, particularly for students of color um, who haven't, who haven't um, matriculated at the same kind of rates or persisted at the same kind of rates because We'll need to watch that the like even when some institutions enrollments may look fairly static, the mix of the students who are participating could be different. So this is something that we're going to need to watch closely uh, to see what happens, especially as as uh, as families are experiencing all kinds of disruption because of the uh, public health crisis. Thank you. I have a question. How are we communicating to the uh, institutions that this information is going to be available, that they can access it? Commissioner, uh, would you like me to answer that? So uh, this is going to be the first that institutions have heard today at this board meeting. Uh, and I, I know uh, th there are many that will be pleased to, to, to know that this service will be available. And we'll be, once the contract has been signed and finalized, we'll be sending information out to institutions uh, regarding the details about how they'll, how they'll access the services and how all of this will, will work. So we, it, we anticipate that very soon we'll be getting uh, We'll be getting notification out to all of our participating institutions. Uh, at this point, it's just our public institutions, but there are also uh, maybe opportunities for our, our private institutions. So we will we will get that that word out there. All right. All right. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next item: uh, agenda items five D through five G were approved on the consent calendar. Agenda item five H one is consideration of adopting the proposed. Amendments to Chapter 1, Subchapter A, Section 1.18 of Board Rules concerning the operation of education research centers. Dr. Julie Eklund, Assistant Commissioner for Strategic Planning, will present this item and be available to answer questions. Dr. Eklund's presentation will include a summary of the written public testimony. Dr. Eklund? Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Stedman. The Coordinating Board proposes amendments to Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 1, Subchapter A, Section 1. Point 118, having to do with the operation of education research centers or ERCs. This rule amendment will allow for improved access to data for education researchers while maintaining controls for data security. First, a little background on ERCs. 
By law, up to three education research centers are authorized to operate in Texas. The centers are located at UT Austin, UT Dallas, and the University of Houston. All are under the oversight of the coordinating board and are governed by an advisory board, with I cha which I chair at the commissioner's request. The ERCs are self-funded and researchers pay fees to access the data. The Workforce Commission and Texas Education Agencies, which provide data, are also part of that, are, are also involved in the advisory board. The board meets quarterly, uh, and in addition to representation from the other agencies that provide data, we have the director of the education research centers and some researchers uh, from, within, from within the state. Research projects must be approved by the advisory board and must be of benefit to the state of Texas. Currently, researchers have to access the P16 workforce data repo repository, and that's the repository Lori was talking about earlier. They need to access it uh, by physically being at the education research centers uh, through special uh, computer terminals there. The rule amendments would allow researchers, when approved by the advisory board, to access this de-identified data for their project via remote access. So again, just access to, to the data needed for their project. The identified data is data that has had student identifiers removed, such as name uh, and, and date of birth. As data security technology has improved, researchers have asked us fairly frequently if remote access would be possible at the ERCs. During the time of COVID-19, it has become a situation that's much more pressing as researchers can't always get to Texas or don't feel comfortable being in a shared space. When several researchers asked the advisory board to look into this, we began a comprehensive process to review the technical, security, and legal aspects of remote access. The advisory board appointed a subcommittee, which included two ERC directors, myself, and the TEA representative on the advisory board, pretty much my counterpart at TEA. We had three meetings in May and invited data security specialists from the ERCs and from the Department of Information Resources. Uh, we also had legal staff from the coordinating board and TEA, as well as uh, representatives from the federal PTAC, Privacy Technical Assistance Center, join us. So that center helps with issues related to federal student privacy laws, such as FERPA. After, and, and I would like to thank all of the people who participated. We, um, we really do appreciate having those, uh, experts, uh, had, having those experts join us. After carefully considering the information provided and determining an approach that would be allowable by law and protect data security, the committee moved forward with suggesting a rule change to allow for remote access. They also made recommendations for clear policy guidelines around this. Security guidelines for access include required virtual privacy network, VPN access, and multi-factor authentication. All FERPA and other federal, state, and education privacy law requirements must be met as stipulated by existing ERC law and rule. Basically, researchers will be able to access the data, but through a portal that does not allow for copying, paste, pasting, or downloading of any of the data. The process of release of the data once it's aggregated stays the same as it did prior to this change. Uh, only aggregated data is released to researchers, researchers to share, and the ERCs have uh, have approval process for that and always always have. The committee's guidelines are clear that this access is a privilege and the guidelines provide the ERC advisory board with the ability to approve or deny remote access based on care, careful review of project components. The board can also remove access once it's granted if there's cause to do so. The 30-day comment period with the Texas Register entered, ended on July 18, 2020 and we received five comments, all from researchers, all in favor of the rule change. And we also received written testimony from a researcher also in favor. A summary of those were provided to the board members and they were in your supplemental materials ma mailed to you earlier this week. And I will summarize here. The researchers who submitted comments are affiliated with the Houston Education Research Consortium at Rice, Yale University's Economics Department, the University of Michigan, Gerald Ford School of Public Policy, Michigan State University, and UC Davis. The written testimony was submitted by an individual with prior affiliations with TEA and Texas State University. The comments centered on common themes. Researchers anticipate the, pros, the proposed rule changes will lead to increased use of the ERC data to address key policy questions across educational and workforce sectors. Further, Remote access can occur while maintaining the rigorous data security standards that are already in place under ERC on-site data access policies without researchers having to travel or schedule time 
to use limited facilities, limited physical facilities on site at the ERCs. In addition, risks and challenges due to the potential spread of COVID-19, uh, while not expected to be long-term, can be mitigated for both researchers and ERC staff under approved remote access policies. Uh, so those are the comments. In the written testimony that was submitted, it was noted that when the ERCs were created 13 years ago, VPN technology did not meet the uh, current standards for functionality and security and uh, that was deemed necessary, uh, but that current VPN technology functionality and security features are vastly improved and the rule changes continue to reinforce the ne necessity for ERCs to train researchers on policies and procedures for ensuring data security. Uh, while the approved researchers will still pay fees to access research and access the data, they will no longer, longer need to incur additional costs due to travel and time away from their institutions. And this was echoed with some of the other comments that reducing those travel costs will be uh, helpful. Uh, the coordinating board staff agree with these comments and I am happy to uh, answer any questions about the, about the proposed rule change. Any questions? This is Donna. I'm curious, when they meet in person, can they copy the information when they're, when they're actually no. on site? So it's the same as remotely, you still can't download That's exactly copy right. It. Yeah, okay. That's exactly right, yes. Right. Well, that, that's kind of was my question too. I mean, so you have all this data right of all these mm -hmm. students and stuff and you can't download it what do you do like take a you know a bunch of legal pads and, and write right like line by line no actually the way this works is that the researchers are allowed into the portal into the data that they've requested they're able to do their analyses and they then they submit a file with their aggregated uh results uh, whether it's aggregated uh, descriptive data or they run a lot of uh, various statistical analyses where they get the results where you can't determine uh, information, you know, student level information from that. They submit those results to the ERC director and staff who review them and they submit them right through that secure portal where they get into the data. They submit them, they're reviewed, and then they are released via email to the researchers saying, hey, this data is good to go. You can publish your studies you can reveal this information because it meets FERPA and other data security requirements. So that process that I mentioned earlier has always been in place and it will continue to be in place with the remote access where the researchers can get in remotely, they can't pull anything out, but they have a place where they can say, this is what I'd like to have released. It gets carefully reviewed. Once it's released to them, they're, they're able to use that uh, in their publications uh, and other work. Okay. That, yeah, I, I just remember my senior thesis. I, I it was a uh, I went through all these New York Times articles, uh, like like on microfiche, and I had these note cards, and I just write all this stuff down. So that's why I was imagining, you know, these people just writing all this data. But anyway, uh, any other questions? Uh, hearing none, uh, do I have a motion to recommend to the full board adoption of the proposed amendments to Rule One Point One Eight? So moved. This is Donna Williams. Motion by Ms. Williams. Do I have a second? Second, Sam Torn. Second by Mr. Torn. Uh, members, when I call your name, please state whether you're voting for or against. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Uh, Mr. Torn? Aye. Ms. Williams? Aye. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Anwar? Aye. Uh, uh, Mr. Anwar, aye, and uh, I vote aye. Motion passes. Um, the agenda item six is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved, Sam Torn. Motion by Mr. Torn. Do I have a second? Second, Donna Williams. Aye. Second by uh, Ms. Williams. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Mr. Anwar's voted uh, aye. Uh, I will vote aye. Mr. Torn. Aye. Ms. Williams. Aye. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. We'll now take a short break to allow staff to set up for the Committee on Academic and Workforce Success meeting. Uh, members joining us via conference call, please remain on the call.